Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven by despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. This is the Word of God for the shepherds of God. Amen. (laughs) All of you in this sanctuary can relate to the experience of having the disconnected dots of a sermon haunt you for days, sometimes weeks, months, and even years. You know, we say to ourselves, one day, I'm going to connect those dots and put pen to paper and write that sermon. It's happened to all of us. All of us have been there. Well, I said that to say that this is one of those sermons that's been disconnected, stirring in my mind for several months. The dots have been there. And since I decided that I would connect them today, I came to the conclusion that I would have no better audience to practice on than you. (laughs) That's what it amounts to. (laughs) It, it, It reminds me of the days when I was growing up in Houston, about 10, 12 years old. My dad would give me money to go to the Tyler Barber College on Dowling. If he was generous or... If the church had paid him, he would give me a dollar to go to the Tyler Barber College. And when you walked in, there was this long row of seats. And a dollar would put you right up in the front. An advanced Barbara would cut your hair. Now, if the church hadn't paid him, he would give me 50 cents. And I could go somewhere in the middle, you know, a mediocre Barbara who would do a pretty good job of cutting my hair. But if he only gave me a quarter, I'd have to go to the back, in the dark, in the booth back there, you know, to somebody to practice on my head. (laughs) I say all of that today because, you know, when the collection plate is passed, put in an extra quarter for the preacher. Because I'm only practicing, all right? (laughs) Let us pray. Lord, speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of thy tongue. As thou hast sought, so let me seek thine erring children, lost and lone. O strengthen me that while I stand firm on the rock and strong in Thee, I may stretch out a loving hand to restless in the troubled sea. Oh, use me, Lord, use even me, just as Thou wilt and when and where, until Thy blessed face I see, Thy rest, Thy joy, Thy glory share. Amen. It is what it is. It is what it is. 
We've all heard those words before. And no doubt many of us in here have probably said them a few times. It it seems that it's become one of the new catchphrases for today. It is what it is. When I hear people use those words, the very first thing that comes to my mind is the image of helplessness, hopelessness, surrender, resignation. Resignation to the circumstances and powers that control and govern our lives. Which, by the way, many times people feel that they are not able or unable to change. Whether you know it or not, and you are out in the public arena, there are a lot of people saying these words in today's society. For it seems as though there's an epidemic of despair and futility in every place you look. In these tough times, it appears that many people have just given up. And with the high unemployment and spiraling gas prices and a depressing economy and our nation's leaders being unable to agree on anything, it renders the feeling of being powerless. Powerless to do anything about it. And that's why it's easy for people to say it is what it is. What What's the person to do? In my ministry, I have discovered two groups of people that reflect this attitude most often. And believe it or not, they are the people that we, you and I, encounter most in our ministry. First, the people most affected by poverty. And secondly, people who are incarcerated. In most cases, these individuals have resigned themselves to believing that they cannot change their circumstance or condition. And the most difficult aspect of all of this, for instance, in working with the poor, it's not getting them the food or the assistance that they need. The most difficult aspect is breaking the vicious cycle that they feel powerless to defeat. Stan Basler can tell you that working with the offender or the incarcerated, the most difficult part is convincing him or her that change is possible and individuals can be transformed. But you see, these feelings of frustration and futility are not isolated to the poor and to the incarcerated or imprisoned. You might be surprised how close we are, all of us are, into entering into that place where we too find the monotony of our work overwhelming and often pointless. Right now, for instance, we are getting ready to move into one of the busiest seasons of our year. Next to Lent and Easter, September through Christmas can often be a nightmare and a blur. There are meetings upon meetings, and you can say amen if you like. Uh, As you try to reorganize after a long summer, there are budgets to set. There are officers to nominate. There are Bible studies to teach. Confirmation classes to establish. Charge conferences. I know I'll get amen on that one. Charge conferences to prepare for. Plans to be made for the holidays. And on top of all of that, sickness and death and all the other day-to-day activities never seem to take a day off. Some of you are in your first few months of a new appointment. And by now, you've discovered the challenge that you are facing. You have probably found out for yourselves what the superintendent did not say (laughs) to you. (laughs) 
I'm going to pay the price for that in cabinet meeting this afternoon. For those of you who are returning to your appointment, you know all too well the difficulty of reinventing yourself for another go at it. And in the midst of it all, it's very easy to just kind of surrender to the predictable chaos and say, it is what it is. But if I've said this once, I'll say it to you again. When we run headlong into that wall of resignation and surrender, when we are ready to throw up our hands in frustration and disgust, when it seems that you've done all that you could and nothing or anything has changed, it is precisely at that point, my brothers and sisters, that God performs his best miracles. You've heard me say all along that the God we serve works best in the margins of our lives. And the margins of our lives is that out-of-bounds area where our human abilities will not allow us to go. It is that place where God gives hope for the hopeless, help for the needy, stamina for the weak, and food for the hungry. I truly believe, and listen to this, that God's vocabulary will not allow him to say, it is what it is. Simply because when it comes to seeing what God can do, nothing can ever be what it was, nor will we ever be able to determine what it shall be until God finishes it. This entire book is full of stories and situations where people have run up against destiny and fate. But destiny and fate can hold a candle to what God can do. Because in 1 Corinthians 1, it says that God's foolishness is our wisdom and God's weakness is our strength. And if you find yourself about to say it is what it is, it simply means that you haven't been around long enough to see what God can do. The Apostle Paul knew this in his second letter to the church at Corinth. He reminds us that the power of God triumphs over and through our weakness and our limitations. I'm talking about the same Paul who begged to have the thorn removed from his flesh. I'm talking about the same Paul who endured shipwreck, stoning, beatings, and imprisonment. In this Scripture, he describes four situations where he could have easily concluded it is what it is. But Paul did not say, when we are afflicted, it is what it is. He did not say, when we are perplexed, it is what it is. He did not say, nor will you read in there, when we are persecuted or struck down, it is what it is. Paul went on to say that we are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. When perplexed, we are not driven to despair. When we are persecuted, we are not forsaken, struck down. We are not destroyed. As Eugene Peterson says, always remembering that our lives are at constant risk for Jesus' sake. This makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. And he says, so while we are going through the worst, you're really getting in on the best. So whatever happens in this ministry of ours, in these trying and testing days that are coming up, we do not lose heart. For we know that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. If I've learned anything in my ministry, it is this, is that I'm not alone in this. 
Because there have been times when I could not explain how something happened and I came out the victor. There have been times, many times, when I have looked around and no one else was there, but somehow I didn't feel alone or isolated. There have been times in your ministry and my ministry when we have to realize that God didn't call us or put us into this all by ourselves. That God is with us in everything. I don't know if you've been paying any attention to the latest space news. I, I just marvel at what NASA is able to do. A few weeks ago, they sent the Mars rover to Mars. They went through their seven minutes of terror as it was coming into the to land. I, I just marvel at that. I mean, it's, it's a magnificent piece of engineering and scientific achievement. I just picked up the paper yesterday or day before where, where the Mars rover had, had z- found a rock and zapped it, you know, just to see what kind of composition it was. Just fascinating as they get ready for more and more things and the pictures that it sends back and, and, and all of that. Two billion plus dollars to send this spacecraft the size of a Volkswagen to this faraway place on Mars. But the thing that fascinates me even more so is that when they got ready to send it, CNN was doing an interview with one of the NASA engineers. And the question was, why? Why are we doing this? What what reason? Why do we spend billions of dollars to go to some distant planet to see rocks and terrain? And the engineer says, well... We just want to make sure that we're not alone. We're not alone. Now, with all due respect (laughs) to the NASA engineers and the people who put this together, been working 10 years on it, with all due respect to them, I could have saved them billions of dollars. I could have saved them billions, us, the taxpayers. I could have saved us billions of dollars if you're in search of the answer or we alone. Because we're not alone. Do they not know, or as the Bible says, have they not heard that the God who created Mars uh, flung the planets and the stars and the moons and the stars, all of that in outer space? Have they not heard that the more that they discover, the more they they realize they don't know. We're still discovering galaxies and universes and stars and moons and planets far beyond what we thought was there. And my answer to them is, how do you think it got there? In the beginning, God created it. And he did all of that. And you ask, are we alone? No, we're not. Because there is a God who cannot say and will not say it is what it is. On that dark Friday, when they took my Savior down from the cross, And they wrapped him and and put him in a grave. And Luke, Luke says they went home. After they did all that they could do, they went home and they rested. Because, you see, they were tired. They had been up all week chasing this man down. And they went home and rested. And I can just, can't you just see him walking away from Calvary, going home saying, it is what it is or can you see Cleopas and the other disciple on their way from Jerusalem to Emmaus bemoaning the fact that all the hope the dreams that they had for Israel were all now dashed and they walked down the road saying it is 
what it is. But all Sunday morning came. And it was not what they thought it was. Because you see the same God who gave him to us also rolled back the stone and said, He is not dead for he is alive. He is risen. He's not here. It's not it is what it is. And, and those two disciples on Emmaus, this stranger, walks up with them. And as they saying, are you the only one who doesn't know what it is, what it is? And I can just hear, hear that stranger saying, are you sure? Are you sure it is what it is? And then he began to unravel for them the great mystery of why it had to be. And when they paused and broke bread, they realized that it was not what they thought it was. Oh, my brothers and sisters, as we go back to the monotony of our day-to-day task, as we prepare for the meetings and the elections and the nominations and all that stuff, there is this Savior who comes alongside of us and makes us realize that we're not in this all by ourselves, that there is someone who has not only a love for us, but a love for what we do because God knows that what we do is not easy. So in the midst of all of this, don't say it is what it is. Say it can be what God wants it to be. It can be those things and more. And when you know, when you know that you're not by yourself and that God can take any situation and make it, Turn it into possibilities. You'll find yourself saying, I can't say that anymore because I serve a God who majors in the impossible and who works best in the margin of our lives where our skills and our abilities end and where his Grace begins. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for never giving up on us and on the circumstances that govern our lives. We we live in a time and we live in a place where people are quick to give up, to throw in the towel, to resign, and to say, I can do nothing more. And it's precisely at that moment, Lord, that we, we beseech of you to come and to open our eyes and our hearts to know that, that when we run headlong into that wall of troubles that prevents us from going over it or around it or under it, Lord, that you are there on the other side of it, beckoning us, reaching through it to bring us into the hope and possibilities that you have for us. Lord, I thank you for these shepherds here today. I thank you for the services that they render to people who are caught in a time and in an age where we are living in an illusion and we're looking for something that is real. You are real. And the love of your son Jesus Christ is as near to us now as it was then. It's just a prayer. Come, touch us, reassure us that we are not alone and that with you all things are possible. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.